Meine Damen und Herren, ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich. Ich bin dankbar, dass ich an diesem Studientag, an diesem Thema Ritual auf der Suche nach einem gelingenden Leben teilnehmen darf. Ich spreche über Cargoitis-Bewegungen und ich werde auf Englisch sprechen. Mein Name ist Cekurame, ich bin der Bischof der Evangelischen Kirche in Papua Neuguinea. So, I will refer to my topic today uh, on this very important occasion, uh, and I want to speak on this uh, cargo movement or cargo cult movement in Papua New Guinea. Cargo cult is not a new topic. It is a topic that has been written, that has been researched, and that has been talked about so, so many uh, times uh, for many years. Since uh, Papua New Guineans uh, came into contact with uh, uh, Western uh, missionaries and the colonial uh, government uh, administrators and uh, the business entrepreneurs at the time. The topic is very interesting and is very sensitive uh, because it is a topic that touches the life of the people, touches the society, and I believe it touches every one of us. I think that is the reason why uh, you chose this topic uh, to be the subject of this uh, symposium uh, for this day. Uh, this topic, uh, the last uh, work on this topic uh, I took part in was the reprinting of the work done by Wegner in the Rye Coast area in the 1960s. Uh, the book was recently published. And today uh, we have decided to talk in this uh, symposium on this topic again because uh, I believe it is very important for you as well as for us here in Papua New Guinea. It is generally assumed that cargo cult uh, believes and also the movements uh, have their roots uh, in traditional uh, religion. Uh, before the missionaries arrived, uh, the idea of um, wealth and the idea of uh, accumulating wealth uh, as have been part of the life of the people in Papua New Guinea. Uh, therefore, it is proper to claim that cargo cult is a different version of a religious movement because it is connected with people's spirituality. And therefore, more specifically, the movement is uh, limited to uh, not the entire region, but uh, in specific areas of the country. Uh, therefore, uh, it is part of this entire movement uh, connected with people's religion and spirituality. With the desire for uh, economic gain or to accumulate a material. A such movement emerged very dynamically uh, in the early days uh, when uh, Papua New Guineans came into contact with Europeans and also Western civilization. Today, Kagokal beliefs and movements are still very much present in the lives of many people and in many communities in some parts of Papua New Guinea, especially in places where uh, the communities are isolated from the towns and cities and from modern development. And therefore, it is very critical to understand that when we talk about cargo cult, it is not uh, you know, a widespread phenomena in uh, all the provinces or regions of Papua New Guinea, but only in some parts. Cargo cult movements have appeared you know, very strongly and compellingly among uh, isolated communities because in those communities, if you see, they are almost isolated from the rest of the world because there is no development, there is no basic infrastructure, etc. And therefore, they experience with their own uh, traditional beliefs, uh, they connect their modern experience with the encounter with the modern forces of colonialism, Christianity, and also uh, the capitalist uh, movement in the entire Pacific, and particularly in Papua New Guinea, where people have been deeply influenced and uh, they try to connect their experiences with this uh, new belief in accumulating modern wealth or cargo, as we say. To understand the phenomena of this movement, it must be traced back uh, to those early days which I have already made reference. And the belief is isolated uh, because uh, in many parts, 
I come from the region uh, in the highlands. Uh, you don't find many people, you know, having this kind of belief, and there is not so much of Kagokal movement in the highlands region. Uh, but you find only in uh, particular areas of the coastal region. At the outset of the colonial uh, mission impact, the island of New Guinea, as it was known at that time, uh, it remained isolated for many, many years. So when people came into contact with Europeans, they uh, completely uh, recreated the story, their experiences and 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 they try to react to those experiences in their own ways. The encounters with the Western forces, as I mentioned, uh, colonization or evangelization or capitalism uh, have opened up new possibilities and new opportunities for people to uh, reinterpret their religious experiences in a new way. Encounters with those foreign forces and beliefs uh, and even cultures of the West often created so much anxiety and curiosity in the people, and people want to uh, explore, people want to understand, and people want to really know, uh, because it is like a whole new chapter being opened, and they just want to understand the old phenomena of uh, the uh, advent of Western civilization. And such a counter between tradition and modernity created this excitement and, and, and gave people the opportunity to uh, create their stories and also to reinterpret you know, their experiences in their own context and the way they understood things in those days. So in this process of adaptation and, and adjustment, and people, you know, they recreated their traditional myths by linking up uh, with the transformation taking place in their society. So in that context, you can already assume that you know, people uh, are able to uh, interpret uh, in the way they feel that you know, they should respond to those new changes. So it is part of the ongoing uh, transformation of society. So the link between existing traditional myth and the advent of Western civilization is an important meeting point where, you know, the two extremes, they come together uh, to create completely a new uh, understanding. And so people were able to uh, react you know, in their own way. And as we now label it as cargo cult, because the belief is connected with you know, materials or the cargo, as we call it, but it is part of the old wave of uh, religious movement connected with the spirituality that exists even before the uh, arrival of uh, the missionaries and the colonial administrators and others. Uh, the leaders of those movements are often they are connected to uh, some uh, places or they are connected to some people. Uh, so mostly in those days, you know, they had association with the missionaries, with the colonial uh, administrators, or even they visited plantations and towns and cities. And so they got exposed to new environment, to new people. And so they, when they returned to their villages, they tried to influence their own communities of their observation and you know, of their uh, experiences. So they come back and they try to retell the story, how they can... Uh, uh, make sense of what they experience, of what they see. And those leaders are always dynamic because uh, they are influential. And so they are sometimes men of, you know, a particular social standing in the communities. So people have some respect for them. And so, for example, uh, uh, you have this story of, uh, in Finsapen, you have this story of, uh, people returning from Rabaul, because Rabaul at that time there was a huge plantation, so um, the Western civilization spread in the region, and, and so people came into contact with money and with, you know, Western goods and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And so when they returned from Rabaul, they recreated a story and influenced the people to believe uh, their stories. Uh, equally also, uh, if you can remember, in the Raikos area, there is one particular story um, uh, as related to uh, a cult leader or cargo cult leader called Yali. And Yali was very influential. And uh, 
he claimed to know the secrets to the uh, white man's world. And so he uh, influenced uh, a big number of uh, followers in this region in the Rye Coast area. Uh, and he was very influential. Uh, and so um, these experiences, uh, we can already see that, you know, uh, the leaders were uh, often, you know, uh, associated with uh, uh, forces that, you know, uh, they uh, are much more influenced and they try to come back to their own communities and to their own people and they try to uh, influence the people of what they believe, of what they see and what they experience. So this was uh, in the past, you know, uh, quite normal. And uh, in Finsavan area, for example, you uh, probably you may have heard of this uh, movement called the Emerson movement. And so the movement was not only uh, focused uh, uh, on material, but it was also connected to Christianity. So people had to perform rituals and they had to do the right thing in order to obtain the blessings. Uh, because the Kagokal movement was connected to uh, the people's spirituality. At that time, you know, a Christian influence was already spreading in the entire region. And so people uh, connected their new experience with Christianity, with their belief in the in, in, in Kago, and also their experiences with uh, Western civilization. And so they came up with completely new versions of, of their stories. But the whole idea behind is to get access to uh, material, you know, how they can accumulate uh, material like money, for example. Because the Emerson movement, for example, was also strongly connected to the search for money because people in those days, they felt that, you know, uh, they wanted to gain access uh, to obtain money, but they couldn't. So uh, they tried to use their religious lens in order to find a way uh, to obtain uh, money. Uh, but the, the question which we can pause now at this time is, uh, what was the church's reaction to this movement? Because the church uh, proclaimed uh, salvation, the church uh, proclaimed liberation, uh, and the church uh, proclaimed the kingdom of, of, of God. And so in the entire context of cargo cult movement, um, what was the church's reaction uh, in those days? Which I think can maybe teach us a lesson how we can react as church uh, to uh, the um, Kagoistic movement today, uh, in today's context. Uh, the church's attempt was very clear because they felt that something was not right. And so they forbade, you know, uh, or they stopped some of those followers from taking uh, part in Holy Communion or t from uh, coming to baptism, for example. So they excluded them, actually, uh, from, uh, you know, the worship life. And so it was a way of discipline, you know. They wanted to teach them uh, uh, what, you know, uh, they should uh, do because uh, Christians believe that you know, it is only through praying to God that, you know, uh, you only, um, um, by faith, you relate yourself to God and, you know, you remain as, as Christian. Uh, but they felt that the Kago movement and the ideas that were spread by those people in those days, uh, you know, did not really complement, you know, the approach of the church. And therefore, uh, they took a very strong and dramatic approach and tried to exclude those followers. But, you know, uh, at the end, uh, people realized and they uh, changed and, and, and they accepted, you know, the decision of the church and, and, and many, many came back. But some even, you know, uh, continued to remain and became very radical, you know. Uh, the next question which I want to force and to get into that uh, section of our discussion now is, you know, the forces that shaped those movements, you know, what were those uh, uh, motivational forces that shaped the whole movement of cargo cult uh, in, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, in the colonial and, and post-colonial periods, the movement arose from, you know, uh, the encounter or people's experience with, uh, you know, the um, advent of uh, foreign forces. Uh, all of those forces, uh, they have one thing in common. Uh, firstly, uh, whether it is uh, the colonial um, 
uh, power or whether it was uh, Christian evangelization or whether it was, you know, the entrepreneurs engaged in uh, the whole movement of capitalism in the region, um, they all have, uh, you know, uh, Western or European elements in them. Uh, and therefore, that was one uh, common uh, underlying factor. Secondly, um, all of this, whether it is um, or it was the church or whether it was the uh, colonial government representatives or whether it was uh, the capitalists, uh, the element of money was also present in all of them, all of them. And, and so uh, they were very strong elements, uh, you know, that really contributed to the, you know, uh, change in the mindset of the people. Uh, therefore, people could not differentiate who was who uh, and, and, and what was uh, what. They uh, saw all of those external forces with a very single melanation lens. And, and, and they saw them as coming from, from outside. Uh, from the European context. Uh, from the people's point of view, anything that comes from outside is attractive and, and they also have some magical f power in them. Uh, for that reason, it is very attractive, you know, and so people uh, uh, thought that there was some magical, uh, you know, uh, thing uh, when they uh, get access to European goods or when they talk to Europeans or when they uh, encounter, you know, uh, uh, things that were brought in uh, by uh, Europeans. So that created the fertile ground for melanations, uh, whose spirituality uh, even traditionally was completely rooted in the traditional religion. So the spirituality of the people, you know, has long been expressed uh, in many ways through rituals and through ceremonies. So that really uh, provided those uh, fertile grounds where um, they encounter with uh, Western, uh, uh, Western uh, civilization uh, completely, you know, uh, blended together. And so people uh, found a way to try to uh, reinterpret and to understand the old phenomena of encounter uh, in a very new way, but using their own melanation lens and uh, in their own melanation understanding. Uh, therefore, across melanation, various movements emerged. It was not only uh, particularly, you know, uh, uh, the Kagokal movement, but also some other forms of movements uh, also um, associated uh, with, you know, uh, people's uh, religion. Uh, today, uh, Traditional and Christian dynamics continue to influence uh, movements, even here in Papua New Guinea. But I believe it is also in other parts of the world too. Uh, new elements were observed into existing spirituality as people, uh, you know, uh, sought for meaning and answers about life and about well-being. Uh, today, new movements emerge as people continue to struggle uh, for many things, and particularly uh, when they struggle for peace for liberation, uh, for equality, and for salvation in the face of increased social disproportions and increased social injustice and increased economic inequalities which have negative uh, consequences on humans and also on societies, which I believe uh, it is happening everywhere across the globe. Um, so in this context, when people, uh, you know, suffer from uh, injustice and suffer from inequality, um, it is very easy for them to try to find alternatives. And often, you know, uh, they use their religious lens to try to find alternatives uh, as they seek for liberation and as they seek for peace and as they seek for answers to all the challenges they face in their lives. Uh, in Papua New Guinea, in the recent times, you know, there have been several waves of movements as well, uh, which are motivated by um, political, economic, uh, social, uh, and also uh, some other conditions affecting people's life. Uh, some of the movements are not directly related to cargo ideology, but they are also connected to human life and well-being. Uh, for that reason, uh, whether it is directly cargo cult or uh, other forms of religious movements, um, they all have one thing in common, that is to find a good life. Um, it is evident uh, from studies and also from other reports 
on those uh, phenomena that cargo cult movements develop out of the feeling of economic desperation, uh, mixed with uh, Christian and traditional beliefs driven by the quest to acquire material blessings. And the word blessing, which I believe is a key word, uh, people desire to obtain blessings. And that is the reason why they have to search for means and ways how to acquire those blessings. So the movements have emerged dynamically since contact uh, with Europeans, as I made reference already. Uh, the movement has both um, elements of tradition and elements of Christianity. Uh, today we can ask uh, again, is cargo cult belief and movements uh, still persistent? Are they still strongly present in the country? The answer is yes. Why? If the movement that emerged in the early 1920s and 1930s uh, re-emerged today, it is very critical to ask again, why does the belief in its movements persist today after many years of contact with Western civilization, after many years of contact with scientific innovation, and after many years of Christian evangelization? To answer these questions, it is important to understand the context in which such movements emerge. Papua New Guinea, you know, is made up of many, many islands. It's also divided by sea, divided by fast-flowing rivers, rugged terrains, swamps and thick forests. Over almost 85% of the population is still living in the rural communities. But many of those rural villages are not connected by roads and bridges. People are still suffering from lack of basic infrastructures like good roads, bridges, schools, health centers, etc. So in those uh, situations, the people are bound to react and to behave in many different ways. In the rural communities, there are less or even no active economic activities taking place. So people don't have enough even because there is not so much lively economic activity. There are no large stores or people cannot buy food or good clothes. There is no good market so people are not able to sell their garden produce even if they produce as much as they could, they cannot sell and get enough money because there is actually no market. Let me give you an example. Uh, the other day I was walking in the woods of Finsafen and people told me uh, there is no uh, economy. In Pidgin they say, uh, no got economy. What actually they were trying to tell me was to say, uh, there is no economic livelihood. Uh, we cannot produce and sell and get money and buy our uh, needs. So actually, they were trying to tell me the struggle they uh, were facing and uh, the in breakdown of infrastructure like the bridges and the schools and uh, health facilities and so on. So the hardship people face, you know, people uh, try to come up with their own interpretations. And in those situations, they adjust themselves and try to find a way how they can survive in their daily lives. So I think that is the bottom line, uh, the hardship faced by the people uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, motivates them to come up with different interpretations. Uh, so when we view uh, Kagoistic movements in the changing context today, uh, how can we understand in the present context? Uh, outsiders often uh, criticize Kagoistic uh, movements as irrational or illogical, outdated and primitive. Uh, that is the common way of trying to uh, react to those, uh, you know, movements. But it is important to view the movements within the social, religious and economic context of the people themselves. In that way, we will be able to understand uh, why, you know, those movements really happened. Uh, from the scientific point of view, the movements can be best described, in my view, as Melanesian attempts to participate in the life uh, today. Uh, it is people's uh, uh, struggle or desire to try to make sense of the challenges they are facing and to uh, make sense of out of those challenges.
So these realities we must uh, understand. So the movements are fueled by diverse social, economic and political challenges. Uh, sometimes those challenges uh, we cannot tell from the outside. Only if we go to the people, live within their communities and experience the real life, we will be able to understand uh, why people you know, interpret things that way, why uh, they are behaving uh, that way. So there are people's response if we see uh, religious movements or uh, cargoistic movements. Uh, they are people's response to the rapid changing world that affects the well-being uh, or what Melanesians often understand as good policing down uh, or in English, life in abundance. Uh, that is the church. I think that is the uh, most important goal which people want to achieve. Uh, people want a good life, abundance in life. Uh, missionaries and social scientists uh, often describe such movements, uh, the Melanesian version of the Church for Salvation, a uh, Church for the Wholeness of Life. The movements had to do with power, wealth and status, health and the goodness uh, of that life. Uh, it's a response to the invasion of an alien or from what comes from outside. As I said earlier, uh, their response to um, Western civilization. The alien or the foreign appears in different forms, such as foreign economic systems, cultures, ideologies, and technology that do not offer relief but enslaves and burdens people. Uh, so they themselves uh, somehow poses a great challenge to the people. Uh, those, uh, you know, uh, innovations or those ideas or cultures coming from outside which people are not used to it. Uh, one of the greatest of those aliens is capitalism. Uh, capitalism promotes egoism, individualism, uh, materialism, uh, even promotes greed and uh, wealth accumulation, then uh, promoting the goodness of life or promoting the well-being of people's life. Uh, so, uh, capitalism in itself I is more uh, destructive um, if we uh, do not uh, make the system uh, promote people's well-being. Uh, due to the apparent increase in social and economic injustices, people uh, use their religion as a lens to find answers. Uh, therefore, Kagokal movements or other related uh, religious movements are indications of this disproportion or inequality or the imbalance uh, that exists within societies. In their church for the oldness of life and with an assumption that the uh, material or the cargo uh, contributes to well-being, people continue to seek political holiness as uh, a requirement for blessing or for good health, for prosperity, and for justice. Uh, that means they have to do certain rituals. They have to follow certain uh, laws uh, in order to uh, be uh, religiously uh, perfect, politically perfect, in order to achieve the results. Cargoistic movement is also evident uh, in PNG politics. Uh, people attempt to link religion and politics together. Uh, political leaders, for example, with a deep sense of renewal and restoration, uh, link politics with uh, global Melanie, uh, messianic movements, for example, uh, and to try to make sense uh, of uh, the politics. This is quite obvious in an increasingly secularized world where Christians continue to make sense of their spirituality. Christians have realized the need to create specifically um, Christian values in an outstanding manner. So politics offers a sphere of holiness, and holiness itself makes uh, political actions more humanizing. So when we talk about uh, cargoistic movements, uh, it is not only within the confine of people living in remote areas, but also within uh, our government system. Um, Political events are given religious significance. Political success and failures are associated with the social and economic challenges faced by the people. And uh, they are interpreted in the context of uh, man's relationship with God. So relationship is a key word. 
relationship must at all times uh, you know, be in harmony. Uh, it relationship must be in order. When relationship is not in order, then uh, something is not right. So people will suffer. There will be no blessing or there will be no cargo. There will be no access to uh, obtaining material. So that is the basic assumption or the belief of the people. So when relationship is, is, is going well, then they know that there will be blessing. So blessing and prosperity are goals uh, often pursued in those movements. Uh, they stand in contrast to inequality or injustice or hostility or disease and sickness afflicting humanity uh, in the entire world. The notions of healing and blessing and prosperity are key ideological values uh, in the movements. It is believed that God will heal and bless uh, if people uh, participate in uh, renewal activities and do it in the right way. Religious movements grow out of this belief that God and the Christian uh, churches are secularized, you know. So the essence of Christianity has declined. So people uh, have to um, reorganize and to do it in a better way again. Uh, because people have lost sight of God's covenant uh, with his promised people, uh, blessings you know, are not obtained. So people are still suffering and uh, the well-being uh, is tested. And, and therefore, people react to seek answers through those movements. Uh, so there is a strong um, motivation. There is a strong zeal um, in uh, those movements to reverse the negative effects of injustice, uh, negative effects of inequality, uh, violence, and suffering in the world. The goal is to overcome those miseries and human sufferings. And therefore, Christianity is used as a convenient channel to construct, uh, construct new pathways to achieve this goal. So people's interaction uh, with the Bible plays a very significant role. Um, it doesn't matter whether the movement is related directly to Kago cult or any other religious movements, um, it is the spirituality that makes a difference, you know, people's connection to uh, a particular deity or to uh, a God which they believe uh, that is the source of the power which blessings can flow. God is perceived as the source of that power where good life comes from. Because the power is external, people need to perform certain rituals, ceremonies and um, follow certain norms. Uh, in order to obtain those blessings. Uh, that is why Melanesians continue to seek external power of God to obtain the good life, the fullness of life, which is the focal point or the, uh, uh, the uh, central point of their religious uh, pursuit. The concern for life uh, is the most important uh, cultural and religious values because they want life to be in order. They want to enjoy life. And life uh, must be enjoyed peacefully, uh, in harmoniously, uh, with uh, justice. So that is what people are looking for. And in all, uh, often we describe it as salvation. Salvation uh, that brings the all sense of liberation to the people. Uh, so what is the significance of Kagokal movements if we ask this question now and try to reflect on uh, the discussions which I already shared with you? In a world where the gap between the rich and the poor is so obvious and uh, increasingly, you know, uh, separates uh, those who have and those who don't have, uh, cargo cars movements can teach us very important lessons uh, about this discrepancy that exists in the old world between the rich and the poor. If the movement seeks to obtain uh, something that is missing in life, uh, whether that is money or food or clothes or shelter or something else, Kagokal movement itself uh, is teaching us to realize our humanity again. Because something is not in order, something is not right, and therefore people are seeking for ways to bring relief to themselves, to seek for this salvation, to seek for this liberation. And, and in their view, God created us to live in companionship, a life of sharing and caring for each other. Uh, that is the key underlying factor 
uh, why they continue to try to link their experiences uh, with their spirituality and with their religious belief. Uh, there is enough in the world for everyone to enjoy, but some have plenty while others have very little or even nothing. Uh, those who have will continue to enjoy and those who do not have will continue to suffer. And those who do not have, in their desperation, they will continue to search for answers, search for relief, search for liberation, search for satisfaction, search for meaning, and search for the oldness of life. There is Kagoistic ideology also in Europe, and I am sure in America, in the rest of the world. Kagoistic ideology is a social phenomena that exists everywhere in the world. But you don't see the movement. Maybe in European context you don't see the movement because maybe there is enough for everyone. So there is no dramatic movement. In Papua New Guinea there is Kagoistic movement and you can see it clearly because they fall short of the cargo, of the material, and they seek to find them. So the ideas of cargo is the same, whether it is in America, whether it is in Europe, whether it is in Papua New Guinea. The idea of cargo is still the same, but the context are different. And therefore, we have to understand in the differences of those contexts, then we will be able to understand why Cargo cult exists and why people develop these movements. So let me come to the close and I want to make the following remarks. If suffering and misery surrounds humanity in the present world, then religious movements in church for the fullness of life signal that reality of the unfavorable social and economic conditions of our world today. If the present human condition of life is not what God intended to be, then the fullness of life which Jesus himself points out clearly and specifically in John 10.10 10, is only a process yet to be fulfilled. In John 10.10 10, Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. In Paul's understanding of salvation, we, he said we are, but not yet. We have reached a point, but not to the fullest. And that reminds us of our reality. Yet Jesus offered his own life to give life, and the life he offers is experienced already in the present world, world afflicted by unfavorable conditions. That is why we are reminded by the scripture to look beyond the present world. Paul presents the present suffering as incomparable to the glory that will be revealed when Christ comes. And what Christ offers and will offer will be the total fullness of life. And this will be the total culmination of man's journey as Jesus promises in John 10.10, 10, which I already mentioned. So, dear uh, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, today in a world where rapid changes create so much confusion, and social stress, life cannot be enjoyed to the fullest. Like in PNG, where people are searching for the fullness of life in the context of Kagoistic movement, in many parts of the world, the rise of religious movements in the 20th century up to now was and continued to be associated with rapid social and economic change. And sometimes those changes create so much suffering for people. And sometimes people are confused and continue to seek for answers to find uh, the freedom and the salvation 
that they desire. When people are confused and dissatisfied with the present social, political, economic, and religious conditions, they tend to seek shortcut answers. And as Papua New Guineans do, they use Kagokal belief to try to express how to find salvation. So Kagokal movement is a movement that links the all aspects of humanity, embracing the social, the religious, the political, and the economic aspects of people and their society. Thank you very much. I now come to the end and I want to pose a few questions. And together we can reflect on these questions. Seeing that the topic which I just discussed with you is still current and sensitive, let me pose the following questions. One, if this is an issue you identify in Papua New Guinea, what advice can you give us or the church in order to respond to the issue if Kago cult is actually a church for salvation or for the oldness of life, as Jesus said in John 10.10. 10. Second, secondly, my next question is, is there any way of closing up or narrowing the gap between the rich and the poor so that everyone can have enough and enjoy life because there is enough in the world for everyone. My third question is, how do you or we together put into context the words of Jesus when he said, I was angry and you fed me. I was without clothes and you clothed me. How can we put these words into perspective and make sense out of it in a more practical and meaningful way? My fourth question is, there is so many imbalances in life and so much injustice in the world today. Do you foresee a better world ahead where these discrepancies can one day be overcome? Is there a better world? Do you foresee one? My fifth question is, the Apostle Paul urges Christians to be content with what we have. Are people content enough with the little they have or the drive to accumulate more is great? Whether it's in Europe, in America, or whether it's in PNG, using a different lens and trying to accumulate by using the Kagokal movement as a means. My sixth question is, as church, how do we apply John 10.10? 10, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. How can we apply that in the light of the inequalities we are facing in the world today? My last question, and this is the seventh question, is in our partnership journey, we as church partners, how can we keep our dialogue more active and more realistic on the topics of inequality, of injustice, and also the need to care and share meaningfully with one another? With that, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.